Take your Bible with me this morning and turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I want to talk to you about a subject this morning that uh, sadly, I must confess, as if we're all honest one with another, uh, that I'm all too familiar with. I've entitled this message, Grieve Not the Holy Spirit. Grieve not the Holy Spirit. You say, oh, I don't want to hear about something like this. Well, it's in the Word of God, and it's a truth that we need to think about because the long and the short of it is this. We are always and ever exactly the same thing that we always were. We are sinners. We are saved sinners. We are justified saints. But like the song that we sing occasionally, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. I wish I could say that was not so, personally. But the reality is, it's just part of us. We want to love God, and we want to love our brethren. We want to serve our God. We want to be, the long and the short of it, we want to be the best we can be, don't we? I hope there's not one child of God here that thinks, you know what, it just don't matter. I'll do whatever I want to do, act whatever way I want to act, not watch my mouth, not watch my actions or my activities. I'm saved by grace. Well, that's not the way that we live our lives. But here's the thing that I I got to thinking about as I was preparing to preach this message this week. I know a a lot of self-righteous legalists. They don't like to hear, nor do they ever even like to consider or entertain such actions like grieving the spirit. I can remember when I was in false religion, when I was a false preacher preaching another gospel and another Jesus, that I never thought at any point in time that I ever grieved the spirit. Matter of fact, we read things in the Word of God that's not there. I I used to think in my lost estate as a religious, moral, sincere, dedicated legalist that if you grieved the Spirit, more than likely you were a lost person to begin with. You didn't know the true and living God. So they don't like to entertain those things concerning themselves or even in others that they consider Christians. They say Christians just should not grieve the Spirit. Well, it's interesting to note who Paul's writing to here. In this letter that we're looking at in Ephesians chapter 4. These folks that take this attitude toward this idea of grieving the spirit. They're like the Pharisees. And the Pharisee that our Lord Jesus Christ spoke of in that parable of the Pharisee and the publican. They're totally unaware. They are walking in darkness. Even while they do those things that impress themselves and other sinners which are in really, in, a, in reality, nothing more than abomination to God. Listen to you. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous. What did they do? What do scribes and Pharisees do? They trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Sounds a whole lot like those people Paul talked about in Romans chapter 10 that he says lost. My heart desire and prayer to God for Israel, my kinsmen according to the flesh, is that they might be saved. For I bear them record, I bear testimony against them that they have a zeal for God but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of the righteousness of God, going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. That's why they trusted in themselves that they're righteous. I guarantee you, if you're here this morning and you do not know the true and living God or you're watching us either on one of the social media networks that we're using, if, if, if you think, if, 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 if you have not rested in Christ as the Lord your righteousness, I guarantee you, you are going about right now trying to establish your own. Now you are. You think that by being in church, you probably are closer to heaven. You think by studying the scriptures, God's probably more well pleased with you. You think by watching your mouth or or watching your actions or watching your attitude, not being unkind and being compassionate and long-serving, you think that those things are 
or what God will accept you based upon. That's what he's talking about. Going about to establish a righteousness. They trusted in themselves that they were righteous. And everybody who trusts in themselves that they are righteous based on what they have done, they do exactly what our Lord says of these people and despised others. You're not like me. Remember those days in false religion? Where you thought you were better than somebody else? That you were more moral and more sincere and more dedicated, that you prayed more or gave more or loved more or attended more or more faithful. Now listen to him. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, and notice who he gives the credit to, I thank thee thank you that I'm not like other men are. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even as this public. Everything this guy mentions, you know what it all has to do with? Outward character and conduct. Things that men do. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And old publican, what, he wouldn't even enter into the temple, standing out in the outer court, smote upon his breast and said, What? God be merciful to me, the sinner. Listen to our Lord's words on this idea of self-justification. And he said unto them, You are they which justify yourselves before men. In other words, men think I'm saved. They thought Saul of Tarsus was saved. And I tell you what, Saul of Tarsus' compadres thought he was saved because they thought they were saved. And when the Lord saved Paul, Saul of Tarsus, his compadres thought, what? This is the best thing that's ever happened since sliced bread, huh? No, because what, what, the implications are so far-reaching. If Saul was lost, what about me? <laughs> yeah, you know, this this sounds awful, but it really doesn't matter what 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 it involves with everybody else. This thing's personal. It's about my relationship to God. Am I righteous? Am I holy? Am I accepted in God Almighty's sight? Do I have a righteousness? Do I have a righteousness in which God can be well pleased? God, tell you, if you don't, I, I, I said it last Sunday, I'll say it again this morning. If you and me are not as holy as God Almighty, we're not going to be with Him. And people say, well, then none of us are going to heaven. You're, you're, you're headed down the right track. Because if it's on me or on you, we're not going. None of us are going. Not one. And that forces me to look where? To this glorious person that this spirit brings to our attention. Even the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, you are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knows your heart for that which is highly esteemed among men. What's highly esteemed among men? Morality. Sincerity, religious abilities, gifts, chain, great chain. Aren't people impressed with great chain? That which is highly, listen, being a murderer is not highly esteemed among men. Even atheists appreciate and respect benevolence. Don't they? Because most of them are benevolent. What's highly esteemed among men is men's religion and morality and sincerity. And he said that that's highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. How do you think that went over with the scribes and Pharisees? You know, it's almost unimaginable. That one chosen by God the Father in the everlasting covenant of grace, 
one redeemed by the blood and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, justified by his imputed righteousness, one born again by the Holy Spirit in time, could or would ever do anything, either knowingly or even unwittingly, that would grieve the Holy Spirit. But here's the reality. We do. We do. Doesn't make it right. And that's not justifying when we do. In our text, the Apostle Paul encourages, notice what he says here in verse 29 and 30. He says, let no corrupt, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 and 30, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is edifying to the use, or that which is good to the edifying, good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And then he throws this in here. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. I'm going to give you three things this morning real quick. That this idea of grieving the Holy Spirit, verse 30, what we can learn from it. The first thing is this. matter of fact, the most important thing that, that I take away from verse 30 is this. Even though we as justified saints do often grieve the Holy Spirit of God, and we do if we're honest. The sin of grieving the Holy Spirit, now listen to this, the sin committed by the believer of grieving the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God, it does not cause us to lose our abiding position in the family of God and the kingdom of God. In other words, what I'm saying is this, you cannot Lose your salvation by grieving the Holy Spirit. Whew. Somebody said, if I see that, hear that statement, and say, you blasphemed the Holy Spirit. No, I hadn't. No, I hadn't. Notice the way the Apostle Paul writes it. That, that the Holy Spirit moves him. And he moves him to write this. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed. You see this? You are sealed. How long? Until you grieve the Spirit. No, that isn't what he said. You see a win until the day of redemption. What's the day of redemption? Go back over and read Romans chapter 8. The day of redemption, you know what the day of redemption is? It's the deliverance of our body. That's the day of redemption. Now, we're redeemed in Christ Jesus, but there's a day coming. What's, what else is going to be redeemed? Even our old bodies. It's going to be changed. It's going to be made like into his glorious body. But he says, we're sealed till when? Till forever. Till we arrive in glory with our blessed Lord. You always keep this in mind. These believers that he encouraged not to grieve the Holy Spirit, what were they? Saints. How do I know that? This is this. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faith, not only are they saints, you know what else he calls them? And to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing when you think about it how graciously God deals with us as his dear children. The Holy Spirit moved the Apostle Paul to, to encourage and to comfort and point out to these people in Ephesus and to every believer that would read the book of Ephesians throughout time, point out to us the absolute certainty and security of our salvation by the work of the triune God in the first three chapters of Ephesians. Go read it. God the Father had a part in choosing us. Christ the Son had a part in redeeming us. God the Holy Spirit has a part in regenerating, converting, and keeping us. He will present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in your sight. Whose role is that? God the Holy Spirit. The Spirit that our Lord said, it's expedient that I go away, because if I don't go, who can't come? But if I go away, the Comforter will come. And see, it's through these doctrinal truths that he set forth in these first three chapters of this 
uh, glorious book of Ephesians concerning the work of all three persons of the Godhead in the salvation of sinners, particularly zeroing in on that doctrine of redemption through the person and work of the God, God the Holy Spirit by which the Holy Spirit seals every child of God. In, in previous messages, I, I've always been careful, and we've read there in John chapter 16, I'd encourage you to actually go back and read John chapter 14, 15, 16, because they all deal with the work of the Holy Spirit. But I've always been careful to point out to you that the Holy Spirit's work, what is it? It's to reveal to the mind and understanding of God's elect, what? Himself? His effect on your life? the changes that he brings forth in you, the morality that comes out of you, the sincerity, the dedication. Is that the Holy Spirit? Does he point to himself? Does he point to the gifts of the Spirit? Is that what he does? I tell you what, if you ever see any church put an emphasis on the Holy Spirit as an entity in and of himself that looks to and points to and attributes salvation to the Holy Spirit, run from it because it's another spirit. Because the Spirit of God does not testify of himself. Who does he testify of? Only one person. He glorifies the Son. And see, in order to more clearly understand this ceiling that he's talking about here, turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse 20. For all the promises of God... In him, or yea, First, Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him amen unto the glory of God by us. Now we, he which establishes us with you is Christ, and hath anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us. You see that? He's not sealing us, he sealed us. And given the earnest, and that word earnest is the down payment. The earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Now verse 22 gives us some insight into the meaning of this word seal that's used by the Apostle Paul in our text back over in Ephesians. Now the original Greek word is translated either sealed or sealing or seal in the English. It's got a variety of different meanings. Listen to this. It means to denote property in things, like a brand. It means to distinguish one thing from another. It means to show esteem and affection for person or things. It means something that ensures security and protection. And it means this as well, to hide and conceal. And all these different meanings, every one of them that I just read to you, can and are applicable in respect to the work of the seal of the Holy Spirit in each and every one of God's elect, in each and every successive generation by expressing the grace of God to His people and claiming them as His property, distinguishing them from the rest of the world, setting His affections on them, securing them, and protecting them, and hiding them under the shadow of His wings. But sometimes the word seal, you know what it means? It means to certify. Or it means to assure the truth of something. Listen to it. He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. Paul put it like this concerning himself. If I be not an apostle unto others, yea, doubtless I am an apostle unto you. For the seal of my apostleship are who? You in the Lord. The way the word seal used here, it speaks of the assurance God gives to his people of their interest in his love. The fact that we are included in his covenant of grace. He assures us of our election by God the Father and our redemption by Christ the Son. He assures us of our interest in Christ and our union with Him, of our justification by and through Him and our certain adoption through Him. And listen to me, the only person 
who can accomplish this is the Spirit of God. He's the only one who can certify or assure the mind and understanding of the child of God of who and what they are and what they actually possess by virtue of their oneness with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit, listen, this is Paul, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are. Huh? Preacher, you don't know what I am. Huh? Yeah, I know what you are. Same thing I am. You're a sinner, but what are you? If you were in Christ, we are sons of God. Here's the second thing I learned from verse, our verse, our text. Turn back over to verse 30. I learned who the person, believers, justified, saints, are admonished and encouraged not to grieve. Grieve not who? The Spirit of God. Now listen. Paul wasn't threatening them with eternal condemnation if they grieved him. And he wasn't, grieved, he wasn't threatening us either. To me, this admonition that Paul gave to these Ephesian believers is kind of like the same admonition that John gave to the believers that he wrote to in 1 John. Remember what he said? My little children, these things write unto you that you do what? Don't sin. Right? That's an admonition. Don't sin. And, if any man sin, literally, but when you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he, Jesus Christ the righteous, is the propitiation. What's propitiation? Perfect satisfaction in law and justice. He's propitiation for our sins, the Jews, that have believed and rested in Christ. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Not all men and women without exception, but who? All God's elect from every nation and kindred and tongue and people. And if you'll notice in our text, Paul didn't say, grieve not to father. Does he? And he doesn't say, grieve not to son. Though you and I, as God's children, we should not want to either grieve the father or grieve the Son. He tells us specifically who are we not to grieve. The third person of the Godhead. Who? God the Holy Spirit. And I've been thinking about this since I wrote it down. I hope I can say this word right. When he makes this statement, grieve not the Holy Spirit, Paul speaks here in what's called an anthropathy. Well, that's a big old word, <laughs> I actually went to Miriam Dictionary and looked up the meaning of it. You know what an anthropathy is? It's uh, to ascribe human passions and feelings to who? To a deity. God doesn't get angry. God doesn't get sad. God doesn't get glad. Those are emotions that human beings experience. That's how we can relate to this thing. And so he puts it in a relatable way to you and me. So we can gain some understanding of what he's talking about here. But why does Paul encourage you and me not to grieve the Holy Spirit? Because the Holy Spirit, who is he? Like God the Father and God the Son, he's God. But as God, who is he? He's the author of the new birth. He's our comforter. He's our advocate. He's our helper. And he's our strengthener. You think about it this way. The Holy Spirit, he's our constant companion who dwells in us. And he'll remain in us until our death. And if we do grieve the Holy Spirit, I tell you what, we can rest assured he will appear at least to cease from all these blessed things to you and me as our comforter and our assurer and our, our advocate and our helper and our strengthener. David understood this all too well, did he not? When he sinned against our God. He said this in Psalm 51, that great chapter that we're so thankful for. He says, cast me, a not, cast me not away from thy presence. David didn't think God would cast him away, but still, what does he say? Don't cast me away from your presence. And take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me by thy free spirit. But here's the third thing that we gain from this text. 
the way that you and I as justified saints grieve the Holy Spirit of God. How do we do that? Well, I tell you, there's so many ways that I can't even tell you all of them. It's impossible to tell you all of them. But it's interesting to note that this admonition to grieve not the Holy Spirit is given in the midst of Paul reproving believers, justified saints. You know what he's reproving of? Of their actions toward one another. The way they're treating each other. This entire fourth chapter, beginning in verse uh, verse 24 all the way to the end of the chapter, all of it deals with how we treat one another. How we treat our brethren. And you know, that'd be consistent with our Lord said in Matthew chapter 25, And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily, verily, I say, Inasmuch as you have done it unto the one of the least of these, my brethren. Who the least? Who have you done it to? You've done it unto me. When you think about it, every believer is sealed into the day of redemption. And every believer, every justified saint, they all possess the same Holy Spirit. So if we dishonor our brethren who are equally loved and equally saved, those regenerated, converted, and indwelt by the same Spirit, we grieve the Spirit. We, we, we can and we also, also often do grieve the Spirit by our actions and by our inaction. We grieve him by our behavior towards our God. Look at verse 14 of this chapter. That you henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him in all things which is the head even Christ from whom... The whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working of the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. We grieve the Holy Spirit by our conversation, our behavior in the world. You see that in verses 17 down through verse 29 where he tells justified saints, stop stealing Stop lying, quit being angry with one another. Believers, justified saints. We grieve him in our vain and sinful thoughts, seeing God has promised that he will keep you and me, that man or woman, in perfect peace whose mind is what? Stayed on him. Stayed on him by the use of the means that God's given us. We grieve the Spirit by unbelief in our heart. Paul wrote to the Galatian believers, Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? We grieve him by minding not the things of the Spirit. We grieve him when we disregard the rules and the dictates and the advice of the Spirit, not making the use of him in his office as our comforter and our strengthener and our encourager. And I tell you, those are just some of the things, as well as others in God's Word, we should avoid. And we should seek to seek the Spirit's guidance in prayer and in study and in love to God and in love to others. But let me say this in closing. We often experience in our lives the results of grieving the Holy Spirit when the Spirit appears to depart from us, allowing our souls to be overrun with darkness, and overcome with corruption. And when we grieve the Spirit, the same exact Holy Spirit purposes to experience weakness, purposes us to experience weakness and grace and a lack of desire to be a part of those spiritual activities that once brought joy and peace to our soul. But thank God the same Spirit does not and He will not ever cast us totally and ultimately away. David wrote, For the Lord will not cast off his people, neither will he forsake his inheritance. You know, Moses understood all too well this sin of grieving the Spirit because the Spirit had told him to do what? To speak to the rock. And he smoked the rock the second time. And for that cause, God wouldn't allow him to go into the promised land. But thank God Moses also knew the God of promise because he said to the children of God when he wasn't going over, and they were about to, he said, when thou art in tribulation and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God and shalt be obedient unto his voice, 
For the Lord thy God is a merciful God. He will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers which he sware unto them. Even when we as justified saints sadly grieve the Holy Spirit that sealed us into the day of complete redemption, that same Holy Spirit works according to God's providence and through God's word to once again draw out our hearts and our minds and our understanding not to himself but to who? But to him who loved us and gave himself for us. I pray that by God's spirit we would never grieve him. But when we do, we do not have to be in despair because the promise still remains true. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Let's stand together and we'll be dismissed. Appreciate your presence. Lord bless you and keep you till we see you next Lord's Day. Donald, would you lead us in closing prayer, please?